Okay, thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, you know, last day of Source. I uh, live in Rhode Island, so I, I drove up here this morning and uh, glad to be able to see all you guys here today. My name is Joshua Wright. I'm going to be talking about some research and some work that I've been doing on attacking and exploiting Zigbee networks and an exploitation framework I've been working on called Killer Bee. So uh, this, is, this is me. Uh, I uh, am a senior security analyst for InGuardians. I'm a senior instructor for the SANS Institute at SANS. I wrote an I teach the ethical hacking wireless class where we talk about all sorts of fun wireless stuff there. I um, have a website, willhackforsushi.com. I'm a very bad accountant, and as it turns out, I, when I was, uh, you know, not before I came to work for, in Guardians, I would do consulting. People would take me out for sushi, and then I would never bill them. So actually, I ended up a little broke at one point, and that's that's what I ended up doing. Uh, so you know, I uh, I specialize in uh, wireless systems. I do lots of uh, you know, fun and interesting work on different technologies, and Zigbee's become more and more of an interesting mechanism for me to look into. I've been spending more and more time taking a look at that, and I'm happy you guys are here today to share that with me. So the kind of model that we're going to be talking about today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to start off with an introduction to Zigbee technology, what Zigbee's about and background stuff, that kind of thing, get us all in the same playing field. We'll talk about why Zigbee is important, why, why we need this protocol, why it's doing something for us that we don't already have, okay? why, why this is something that we're going to continue to see more and more of as we go forward into the future. We'll also look at some examples of Zigbee and there's some fun with that. And then we're going to talk about uh, the Killer Bee attack framework, which is some tools and some techniques and ways to be able to exploit Zigbee networks. And I'm going to be showing you some demos, looking at some tools, and we'll be doing some fun stuff there. And then we'll uh, look at a couple of attack scenarios as well, and how we can use Killer Bee to actually exploit these ZB networks that are in there today. So uh, how many people have heard of Zigbee before? Just as a, you guys didn't come here not knowing what you were going to be hearing about, right? Okay, so uh, Zigbee is one of those protocols that's been around for several years now, but it's really only coming into its own recently, where now we're seeing more and more deployment, more and more action. People are talking about Zigbee. You're getting Google alerts and all this stuff is going on. It's become more and more interesting. In a nutshell, Zigbee is a low power, low data rate protocol, 250 kilobits per second. Yay! Okay, well, all right, it's not, you know, the, by itself, that's, that's not that exciting, right? We've, we've got low, low data rate protocols and stuff like that. What is interesting about Zigbee is that it is fairly sophisticated in its deployment model with built-in mesh or star networking support, and it's very low power. You can run a Zigbee radio for perceivably five years on a single set of batteries, and that opens up all sorts of new application opportunities for us. Now, we can have little tiny embedded devices talking to each other. We could certainly do that with other wireless protocols as well, but they were too resource intensive, or, or the battery didn't last long enough, or, or this, that, or the other thing. But Zigbee now gives us the ability to connect these little tiny peripheral devices over a wireless link. And that's opened up all sorts of interesting opportunities. Uh, the Zigbee Alliance is the group that you know, markets and defines a bunch of upper layer stuff for Zigbee. And they say, you know, we want Zigbee to be used in all these different places. We want it used in remote control applications, replacing your IR remote at home to control not just your TV, VCR, DVD player, all that kind of stuff, but to control your dishwasher and, and lights and, and washer dryer and, and all that kind of stuff too. They also want to use it for healthcare systems so that people that need medical attention like blood pressure monitors or oximeters and things like that can use Zigbee in these little tiny embedded hardware forms to talk to a collector that sends it out over the internet to their doctor. Energy management, okay, how you better use energy in your home, or even home automation profile, where now you can control things like door locks and when your shades are going to open and close, how you control your air conditioner all over Zigbee. Uh, by comparison, building automation. Well, now we're not talking about door locks so much. We're talking about huge machinery, generators, huge HVAC, cooling, airflow systems, controlling all those kinds of things. And now they're adding telecom as well, where they want to start competing with Bluetooth and start doing more and more deployment. Uh, Zigbee is a very interesting technology, and there's lots of stuff going on with it, and I think we're going to see more and more of it as we go forward. Now, underneath the hood on Zigbee is the IEEE 802.15.4 protocol. 802.15.4 is used in many other areas as well, but it's the underlying mechanism. One of the nice things about 802.15.4, from my perspective, is that it's based off of 
of DSSS, like 802.11b networks. What does that mean? It's really easy to sniff. Like Mike was saying in the last presentation, Bluetooth, hard to sniff. Wi-Fi, very easy to sniff. And similarly, Zigbee, very easy to sniff. So we've got that going for us here. Um, when we look at vendors and they say they're using Zigbee, they're using wireless sensor networking, another term to refer to these 802.15.4 networks, you know, there's all these proprietary stacks that use it as well. So vendors like TI, Microchip, Ember, Atmel, they each have their own proprietary add-on mechanisms as well. They all have their own problems. But today, I'm going to be focusing mostly on Zigbee technology here. Now, when we look at the security of Zigbee, it's not like it's security absence. They, they did have some security mechanisms in place. In fact, they used the AES encryption algorithm. Woohoo! Well, that makes everything okay, right? That's just like ponies and rainbows, and, right? Well, they're using a modified version of the CCMP, right? CCMP stands for Cipher Block Chain Encounter Mode Message Authenticity Check Protocol. It's an acronym that makes you hate acronyms, okay? They use a modification of the CCMP mechanism that we use for Wi-Fi networks called CCM Star. It works very similarly from an encryption perspective to Wi-Fi networks using AES CCMP, but they allow vendors to make more choices. They allow a vendor to say, you know what, I want to encrypt, but I don't want to have an integrity check. Or I want to integrity check, but I don't want to encrypt. Or I want to have a weaker integrity check mechanism or a more secure integrity check mechanism. So we get options with Zigbee, because options are good, right? With Zigbee networks, we have the notion of a shared key. Okay? We've got a network key, and the network key is shared among all the devices in the network. If you have knowledge of the network key, then you're able to get access to the network. But remember, we're not talking about Windows operating system devices. We're talking about little embedded platforms, little microcontrollers with 4K of flash. That's it. Okay? Not a whole lot of resource on the kind of devices that we're talking about. Well, how do we get that key onto those devices? How do we rotate and manage that key? That becomes a big challenge with Zigbee networks, as we'll see. Okay, so why is Zigbee important? Okay, we, we did a little bit of background, right? The boring stuff. Okay, there's, there's some stuff, there's encryption. Okay, there's some stuff going on here. Why do I, why should I care about Zigbee? Okay, well, we have all these devices, right? We have more and more intelligent things. GE has announced smart appliances coming to your home soon. Or now your oven will have wireless connectivity, Zigbee. And now you can control things like your washer dryer. You know, I'm not going to run my dryer right now because electricity is very expensive. I'm going to defer that dryer run until later when electricity is less expensive. And that's all controlled over Zigbee or intends to be controlled over Zigbee. When we look at that kind of application, Wi-Fi just doesn't fit, right? Wi-Fi is, is too complicated, it's too bloated, it's too expensive, too much battery power requirements. Bluetooth doesn't fit either. Bluetooth is closer to Zigbee than Wi-Fi is, or closer to that kind of embedded link magic that we'd like to have, but it's still very resource intensive, very battery intensive because of the frequency hopping algorithm that's used with Bluetooth. Lots of complexity going on there. So we don't really have a protocol before Zigbee to let us connect all these peripheral devices. Zigbee's a thing that comes in and helps us with that. Zigbee's designed to be low cost, low speed, and low power. When low cost, low speed, and low power are your priorities, what, did, did I miss something there? Was, was there, you know, what other kind of thing would be interested in that I didn't mention? Yes, security might be interesting there, right? When low cost, low power, and low speed are your priorities, well, security suffers. Right? And that's what we'll see in a couple of minutes. All right. Here's why I care about Zigbee. Okay? Zigbee allows me to interface with the real world, the kinetic world, physical devices, more than any other wireless packet protocol. Okay? We've seen Zigbee used in some very interesting places, like actuators for natural gas control valves, okay? Natural gas system, there's a control valve. That control valve is open or closed over Zigbee, okay? Water spill gates at hydro plants, where the water spill gate opens a certain number of degrees to let more water spill or to let less water